I'm sorry, I'm, I'm usually uh, more eloquent, but you know, to be perfectly candid, uh, and I think this is true of probably a lot of the people who listen to your podcast, uh, my sense of uh, fury as well as helplessness um, has kind of you know overwhelmed my circuits in um, in the last forty eight hours. And now I welcome back to this podcast, Brett Stevens, New York Times columnist, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, former international global affairs columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and former editor in chief of the Jerusalem Post, who lived in Israel uh, in the early 2000s, running the Jerusalem Post there. Brett, thanks for coming on. Uh, I'm sorry about the circumstances in which we're speaking. So... Yeah. Um, so let's start with what we know now. There's some reporting coming out, which sort of confirms what we thought, which is that Iran was involved behind uh, this this invasion of Israel. What what do we know, and what's your sense of what we know? Uh, the the news from. Hamas, the admission that they had coordinated this uh, and, in fact, gotten the permission, the green light from Iran, uh, didn't surprise me at all. We've known for a very long time that Hamas has been, I mean, more than 20 years uh, that Hamas has been getting uh, arms and aid from uh, Iran. It may be a Sunni terrorist group, uh, but uh, Iran's interests uh, uh, go beyond their um, uh, parochial religious differences and, and destroying, uh, wanting to and seeking to destroy uh, Israel. The admission, however, is uh, significant in that it's essentially an invitation to war, and uh, that's how I think we should uh, look at this. What has transpired so far, uh, as we speak, as horrific as it is, is I think going to be. Um, I'm sorry to say, one front in a multi-front battle that is going to unfold, not over days or weeks, but potentially over months. And Iran, one would think, they, they've publicly admitted that they were involved? Yes, they have publicly admitted that. And would they not have They're anticip- boasting of it. They're boasting. Boasting. Would they not have anticipated that this could lead to a multi-front war involving them by boasting of it? I mean, it it, it takes away any kind of veneer of, you know, oh, there's speculation. No, there's no question it's an invitation. Um, I, I mean, uh, first of all, they're boasting of it because they're proud of uh, the carnage and the murder and mayhem they inflicted. Um, uh, but they're boasting of it because I think that it is a way of signaling to Israel, come get us, um, which means that they have probably very carefully prepared a northern uh, option um, in uh, in Lebanon, potentially in Syria, and maybe in 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 uh, other theaters. So the Iranians clearly see this as a kind of a decisive confrontation with uh, Israel. You know, there have been occasions in the past where there have been um, conflagrations, uh, particularly in the north between Israel and Hezbollah, and when the sides did not have an interest in escalating, they very quickly uh, uh, brought down the. Um, the, the level of violence. Uh, there was a kind of a deliberate, uh, almost an understanding between the two sides. This is a, you know, a, a kind of come try to get me if, if, you're, if you're brave enough to, uh, to do so. And uh, Israel needs to be very thoughtful about how it seeks to uh, confront Iran and how far it wishes to um, escalate what already is going to be a, um, a as large a war as you and I have seen uh, in our sentient lifetimes. So, Brett, let me just pick up on that particular point. Does Israel have the option on whether it fights a multi-front war? And what I mean by that is all the focus right now seems to be on Israel taking on Hamas in Gaza and doing what it needs to do in Gaza. And then there's the question, as you stated earlier, and others have pointed to, that Iran may want a multi-front war. And and I, what I'm hearing from you is Israel can choose whether or not it 
has that multi-front war? Does it have a choice? Can it say, look, we're just going to focus on Gaza and we'll deal with Iran later or we'll deal with Hezbollah later? Or is all of this going to start boiling up really quickly outside of Israel's control and the timing? Well, you know, there's the adage that um, in every war, the enemy gets a vote. And so whether it has a choice will depend to a large extent on whether uh, Hamas or other Palestinians in the West Bank try to start an intifada. It will depend on whether Arab Israelis will riot as they did uh, two and a half years ago during the last uh, um, conflagration over Gaza. Uh, We're seeing uh, skirmishes on the northern border that were started by Hezbollah. So Israel may have no choice but to uh, engage a multi-front war. It has to be thoughtful if it doesn't have to escalate about the extent to which uh, uh, it chooses to do so. Ultimately, this is going to lead to a major uh, confrontation with Iran, but whether it happens uh, this month, uh, next month, next year, or in, in five years, that's that's a harder question uh, uh, to answer. Um, you know, I, I, I have been thinking about what Israel needs, um, and, and it, it doesn't need, it, it cannot gain an unconditional victory because that suggests unconditional surrender on the part of its enemies. But it needs, in this conflict, to gain an unequivocal victory, if you understand what I'm getting at by by that. Uh, Israel surrounding the Third Army in uh, the Sinai, the Egyptian Third Army in the Sinai in 1973, and Israeli tanks 20 miles from Damascus, uh, was an unequivocal victory, which... um, uh, even the score, more than even the score for Israel in 1973, and strengthened its hand uh, as it went ultimately from that debacle to a lasting peace with Egypt. Um, Israel will need an unequivocal victory now uh, if it's going to uh, emerge from from this disaster, from this crisis and tragedy uh, uh, in a state that isn't significantly weaker than it had been in uh, just a few days ago. In terms of other fronts, so obviously Hezbollah is a proxy of Iran, and Iran could light up Hezbollah at any moment. When I had Haviv Retigur from the Times of Israel on my podcast the other day on the weekend, he said that he's not so sure Hezbollah is eager to strike, that their situation, even though they have 10 times the capability that Hamas does, 10 times the rockets, they have, but their situation in Lebanon is precarious. Lebanon itself is a mess. And there is enormous risk for Hezbollah getting embroiled in this. So is, is it, despite the rhetoric and despite a few symbolic artillery uh, shells, you know, fired over the weekend from the north, is it your sense that Hezbollah is, is trigger happy to get in the fight or is not so sure? Look, Haviv is a very bright uh, guy, a very good analyst, um, and I hope he's right. Um, but the equation in Lebanon, I think, is significantly different from where it had been uh, 17, uh, was it 17 years ago, 16 years ago, during 17, yeah. I guess, during the 2006, 2006 war, yeah. uh, war, in that, uh, I mean, Hezbollah is now Lebanon. Um, there aren't other, I think, significant factions within Lebanon that can stand up to uh, Hezbollah. So... Uh, how they assess their political position in Lebanon today, which is a completely failed state, uh, is, is just different from where from where where it had been in 2006, when when their position was somewhat more precarious, and there were at least uh, viable countervailing forces within within the Lebanese uh, state. Uh, look, at the end of the day, what Hezbollah thinks doesn't matter. What matters is what their ma- masters in Tehran think, uh, and and so that that's a calculation that is you know lives within a black uh, a black box, and, and we'll just have to see uh, how it turns out. And in terms of other fronts, so there's Hezbollah, there's Iran, you know, Hezbollah in the north, Iran obviously is Iran. And then there are other fronts that are almost potentially more scary. So a third front could be Palestinians in the West Bank, 
And a fourth front could be Israeli Arabs living inside the Green Line, inside, you know, within Israel's 67. Yeah, and and there's an additional front, I I should point out, which is um, uh, areas uh, around the world where Israelis tend to congregate, vacation. Um, So think of the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires in, uh, what was it, 1994. Yeah. They're vulnerable Israelis uh, all over uh, the world who are almost surely... Uh, at risk or at heightened risk uh, today. Um, so the the possibility of uh, a a spiral of um, of anti-Israel, anti-Semitic violence is is as vast as as it's ever been. Well, over the weekend, two two Egyptian, two Israelis in Egypt were attacked. That was uh, that was what I was about to yeah, to yeah, mention ahead, next, and and that's going to be true. You know, not just in in uh, Arab states, uh, but throughout the world. Okay. Um, in terms of Israel's, and you wrote about this in your in your column over the weekend in the New York Times, which we'll post in the show notes. You you talked about the the uh, conceptia, the the concept of Israeli security, the conceptia, you know, around the Yom Kippur War post-Yom Kippur War, the change in thinking about the concept of Israeli security, the security paradigm. There was another security paradigm that existed basically sometime after Hamas. So Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005 uh, unilaterally, and Hamas, uh, the Palestinian Authority, uh, Abbas, took over, was in charge of the West Bank and Gaza. Then they were driven out by Hamas 2006, 2007, they formally took over, Hamas took over in 2007. Can you describe what Israel's security posture was with regard to the Gaza border once Hamas took over, basically beginning 2007 till this weekend? Well, uh, you know, the, 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 the basic concept was that uh, Hamas control in Gaza was acceptable and in some ways advantageous so long as it was contained um, and contained and containable. And, you know, Israeli policymakers seem to feel very sure that on the whole, it was a containable threat that uh, uh, was, you know, obviously uh, bad, but uh, preferable to all the other uh, alternatives for Gaza. There was no appetite in the Israeli security establishment to uh, uh, take Hamas out of power, to much less to reoccupy the Gaza Strip after uh, disengagement back in uh, back in two thousand and uh, and five. And there was a belief that technical solutions could uh, effectively solve most of Israel's problems. And for many years, they did. You had not just the technical solution of uh, Iron Dome, which seemed to work uh, almost magically until uh, until it, it didn't, um, but then the technical solution of the, uh, of, of the technology that stopped or appear to have stopped some of the the tunneling uh, uh, the tunneling efforts you know it's a it's a bad thing when states substitute technical solutions for strategic thinking and I think that's largely what uh, what happened here um, it, having a, 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 a terrorist statelet sworn to your destruction hard on your border is ultimately going to have uh, serious consequences and I remember interviewing people uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in 2009, just after Operation um, uh, Cast Lead, uh, uh, conducted mainly by the Olmert government. And Bibi at the time was very critical of Olmert for allowing uh, Hamas to remain in power and for uh, for not uh, retaking the, the so-called Philadelphia corridor along the border with Egypt, which meant that the supply... Just, of- just for our listeners, the, the term of the Philadelphia corridor has actually nothing to do with it's not. It, it was. It was just a, a code name for this particular area. Yeah. And it's, it's not it's, a U.S. Yeah, no, it's it's Philadelphia. Right. I exactly. not Philadelphia. Right. Um, it's just. It's just the six miles or or whatever, however many uh, kilometers uh, of the Egyptian Gazan uh, border. And when 
Sharon withdrew from Gaza in 2005. He also withdrew from the corridor, which meant that uh, there was a brisk trade in in, in munitions and uh, you know supplies uh, taking place in underground tunnels that that richly fed the uh, the Hamas's war machine. And and so when I interviewed Bibi in 2009, a few years after disengagement, he was strikingly critical of that. But he allowed uh, that to persist to the point that he was allowing the Qataris to fund Hamas to the tune of, of uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars uh, every uh, every year, ensuring that Hamas could, you know, keep keep its war machine going and and maintain, you know, basic levels of, of uh, you know, uh, standard of basic standards of living in, in Gaza, perpetuating its rule. And that was the concept of Israeli decision makers, that Gaza was uh, was uh, containable, that having Hamas's control in Gaza uh, effectively divided the, the Palestinians into two uh, uh, hostile, if not warring, uh, political uh, camps, that Israel had no interest in retaking the Strip and being responsible for its two million odd people. Uh, and so that was, that's how, what, what they were going to do. And the, the only thing that wasn't planned for in this otherwise brilliant concept of theirs were you know uh, was uh, uh, a bulldozer through through the gates and hundreds of uh, Hamas terrorists streaming in and massacring people uh, at at will so it's it's once again a reminder of how uh, cleverness uh, fails in the face of obviousness in terms of the next phase, Israel has announced there will be a major operation in response to the attack, to the war uh, that was waged, that was launched on Israel over the weekend, including, it sounds like a major ground invasion, something like over 100,000 troops called up. What is, assuming Israel does have the time and space, and I want to come back to whether or not it has the time and space to do what it needs to do, but let's pause it for a moment that let's just assume that it does. You've, you've lived in Israel, you've, you've been a journalist in Israel, you've also been a journalist covering lots of wars, conventional wars, insurgency wars, you've, you obviously cover geopolitics. What is, and, and, and I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you know Israel, and, and you know the, the, how shaken the Israeli population is, and shaken is different than being humiliated. Shaken is is a, a sense of feeling vulnerable. And you know when Israelis feel vulnerable, no matter how divided they may be at any given moment with their political debates or whatnot, uh, when the Israeli population is feels vulnerable, they, they have a, a certain um, determination. Um, wh- what is that, assuming that determination is persists, which I think it will, what, what, is, what do the next few weeks look like? Well, I think that, um, you know, I, I hate questions like this, Dan, because it's easy if you ask me what the next hundred years looks like, and then nobody remembers the answer. Uh, right, there's no accountability. Uh, but there's accountability. I'm, for- I'm, I'm, I'm caveating this, that you have, we, you and I have no idea, but just, you know, you, you, you've, you've covered the skirmishes on the Israel Gaza border, which you talked about earlier, which is which is what populated most of the recent conflicts. And I, what I'm just trying to explain to listeners and get people to understand is this will be different. This will probably be different. Much oh different. well, this will be different in the sense that I think having sustained the kind of casualties they they just have, Israelis will not um, uh, will not uh, will accept that there will be. Um, serious military casualties that have to follow in pursuit of a uh, a decisive uh, military outcome that that doesn't simply uh, result in a, in a bunch of damaged or destroyed buildings in Gaza, but a fundamental uh, change in in uh, uh, the status quo there, the end of Hamas's uh, regime. The capture and killing, uh, uh, probably the latter of its entire leadership, um, uh, all the efforts that can be made to rescue the hostages, but those efforts, I, I suspect, are going to be very uh, complex and heartbreaking. Um, 
and a willingness to take the fight uh, wherever uh, it presents itself. I mean, we're talking about the call up of 300,000 uh, reserves. That is by this by by any standard, uh, uh, certainly Israel standard, a huge number of forces that are now being mobilized and and fielded. Uh, and my sense is that they're going to be uh, they're going to be uh, employed. Um, uh, and I I I just judging from uh, my conversations with you know my dear Israeli friends and. and I think all my truly close friendships right now are in Israel. Um, the mentality seems to be there will be judgment and accountability about our own failures in due time. And right now, uh, we have uh, a war to fight and win. And so there's a kind of a sense of very grim determination uh, to... Uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, change things very dramatically. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm usually uh, more eloquent, but, you know, to be perfectly candid, uh, and I think this is true of probably a lot of the people who listen to your podcast, uh, my sense of uh, fury as well as helplessness um, has kind of, you know, overwhelmed my circuits in... Um, in the last 48 hours. Before I let you go, two final questions. One, um, we have been told that, uh, it's my understanding, that when Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Biden spoke over the weekend, they spoke more than once, but on Saturday at least, in the list of requests that the Prime Minister had for President Biden, one of them, and I guess the most important, was give us space and time. Give us space and time to do what we need to do. This is not going to be a quick operation. And you know when these things start, whether it was Lebanon in 2006 or when it was any number of wars with, you know, or, or, or skirmishes with Gaza over the last 20 years, the U.S. has Israel's back until it doesn't, right? And in, in, in 2006, it was like 32 days. Did, and then Bush and Condi told Israel, enough, you got to stop. Uh, and and in 2000 spring of 2021 skirmish military escalation with Gaza, you Biden administration had Israel's back, and then after I can't, it was you know X number of days, they said okay, now time for diplomacy. And you know the most dangerous words I think right now is are now is the time for diplomacy because the, Israel is is you know you have explained is not this is the this is not normal. This is like not just one 9-11, but many 9-11s happening in Israel. And no one after 9-11 was telling the U.S., hey, before you do anything, it's the time for diplomacy. Yeah. Um, uh, look, I if I had been in the shoes of um, the prime minister, I would not have said, give us space and time. I would have said, we will take all the time we need to accomplish the ends we require. Uh, so the... Uh, the it's it's not a moment to ask for America's diplomatic permission or diplomatic blessing. Uh, the Biden administration, by the way, the president uh, spoke well, at least in his initial response. Um, uh, so did so did Secretary of State uh, uh, Blinken. But this is this is an existential crisis right now for uh, Israel, and when you're in an existential crisis, you don't need anyone's permission to. Uh, uh, to 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 secure your 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 life and sovereignty, um, what what Israel really should be asking for uh, right now um, is um, uh, the kind of munitions they're going to need, uh, particularly in the event of a wider war with uh, Iran, uh, larger conventional bombs, uh, bunker busters, uh, the the sort of stuff that the United States. Produces, you know, in such uh, quality and abundance that uh, can help the the Israeli war machine accomplish uh, accomplish, uh, you know, uh, decisive ends. Finally, Brett, uh, can you? I, I just want to end on this question. We're going to hear two things. In addition to it's the time for diplomacy, which is inevitable. The other, the other 
word we will use is proportional, that Israel's response should be proportional. People are a little more careful now about using that absurd term, but we will hear it. Uh, we've always heard it in the past. Can you explain what what that means, proportional, and why it's so why Israel's held to a standard in quote unquote proportionality that no Western government is ever held to when confronted with a war like this? Um, look, uh, it's proportionality that has, in effect, brought Israel to its current crisis, which is to say that knowing that it faced a mortal threat uh, to uh, 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 in, in in Gaza, it it repeatedly restrained itself to limited military operations um, that that didn't achieve decisive uh, results. It's like fighting cancer and saying. We're going to just get the cancer down to a, a, a more manageable size, and when it starts growing back again, uh, we'll 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 irradiate it, but only you know we won't actually remove uh, the cancer uh, uh, itself. The United States did not behave in a proportionate fashion when it responded uh, to Pearl the attacks on uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. We didn't say, okay, we're going to bomb uh, the Japanese Navy in Yokohama, and therefore you know. Uh, uh, have a have a proportionate uh, result. We endeavor to rid the world of Japanese militarism, fascism, and Nazism, and and, and that's what we did. And that's why uh, we look back at World War II, which, by the way, involved um, uh, American military attacks, which uh, uh, were the essence of disproportion. Uh, like the Tokyo fire raid or the bombing of Dresden, uh, or not to mention Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and we look back on it as the good war because we were fighting an uh, evil enemy and we were fighting for uh, our our safety and our existence. And I think Israel should look at it in, in the same way. Proportionality sounds like a morally and legally reasonable doctrine, but the result uh, is, is not just perverse. The result uh, is that it guarantees um, uh, future conflict uh, and, uh, and future tragedies. So I hope that that is a word that uh, the Israelis and, and ideally Americans too um, uh, jettison. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> by that by that standard, the United States should have in 1944 stopped uh, at the uh, uh, at the edges of the old German borders um, uh, once French and Belgian and Dutch sovereignty had been uh, restored. Uh, it's 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 just absolutely uh, uh, absurd to conduct uh, war by 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 those by those terms, and it's I think one of the reasons why um, groups like Hamas and uh, not to mention governments like those in Russia and Iran have uh, have sort of seen sort of uh, been emboldened uh, to do what they what they have done because they always feel that their adversaries and enemies um, are going to abide by a set of rules and concepts of proportion, which ultimately serve their interests, but not ours. Okay, Brett, we will um, leave it there. Uh, thank you, as always, for your insights and your and actually the, the rawness of uh, some of your reactions, which, which I totally sympathize with and share. So I uh, hope to have you back on. Uh, sadly, this is this, at least this crisis is not going away anytime soon. And your voice is extremely important. So I'm grateful. Okay, Dan, I'm uh, sorry that uh, we have to have a conversation on a subject like this. But here we are. Yeah.